It's the Veterans Radio Hour. Proudly supported by McDonald's and their national salute to the U.S. military. Now, stay tuned for the Veterans Radio Hour next on the TRN Talk Radio Network. Tango Charlie Bravo, you're a go for the Veterans Hour. Hi, uh, she'll have a Happy Meal and I'll have the Big Mac. Dad, when will I be old enough for a Big Mac? When you're in college. College. Now, when you register specially marked McDonald's gift certificates at youpromise.com, a portion of the value goes into a YouPromise account for a child's education. So, the more specially marked gift certificates you buy, the more you'll save for college. I want to be a doctor. Hello, gift certificates. Sign up for free and get the details at youpromise.com. We love to see you smile. Welcome, one and all, to the Veterans Radio Hour. It's our tribute to all of those who served our great nation's armed forces, past and present, and their tremendous accounts of heroic duty and bravery. With your host, Brigadier General Dave Grange. And now, coming to you live from our Veterans Center studio, here is General Dave. Good evening, this is Ranger Doug. Tonight we're going to replay for you an original broadcast which was originally aired on October 6, 2002. It gives an account of the battle commonly known as Black Hawk Down, which was fought nine years before on October 3rd, 1993. In the studio with General Grange are several rangers who fought in the battle as well as one on the phone and the author of the book Black Hawk Down, Mark Bowden. The book became the movie and there are no finer pair of book and movie in our military annals than those two. And they're very instructive about things that we would ultimately experience again during the global war on terror. General Grange and the Rangers make excellent observations about that fight and what it might have meant in the war on terror. And of course, now here we are almost 20 years later digesting the outcome. 99 elite American soldiers are trapped in the middle of a hostile city. As night falls, they are surrounded by thousands of enemy gunmen. Their wounded are bleeding to death. Their ammo and supplies are dwindling. This is from the book Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden. Tonight we're going to talk about Mogadishu 1993, October 3rd, and Task Force Ranger. We're going to talk about war, about heroes, about pain, and about brotherhood. In the Veterans Radio Center tonight, on my left, my right flank, we have veterans from the Mogadishu combat. Mike Goodall, Steve Anderson. And we have several other Rangers with us tonight at the table, and the senior producer as well, Kenny DeCamp. On the telephone, we'll have tonight another Ranger that was at the battle, Kenny Thomas, and the author of the book, Mark Bowden. In the studio, we have fellow veterans from other wars and operations around the world, and other Americans who care about our country's veterans. This will be a great show tonight. It's up close, it's personal. You will be able to smell the cordite in the air. You will feel the pain, the emotions, and the pride of America's GI. Hua. We got a Black Hawk down. We got a Black Hawk down. Super 6 1 is down. We got a bird down in the city. Get an MH6 on site. Check for survivors. Tonight we're going to dedicate our show to the 19 killed in action, 19 American GIs of Task Force Ranger. And we're going to do that by highlighting the valor displayed by Master Sergeant Gary Gordon and Sergeant First Class Randy Shugart, sniper team. What Master Sergeant Gordon learned that ground forces were not immediately available to secure the second crash site, he and another sniper unhesitantly volunteered to be inserted to protect the four critically wounded personnel, despite being well aware of the growing number of enemy personnel closing in on the site. Inserted 100 meters south of the crash site, equipped only with sniper rifles, a pistol, Master Sergeant Gordon and his fellow sniper, while under intense small arms fire from the enemy, fought their way through a dense maze of shanties and shacks to reach the critically injured crew members. They immediately pulled the pilot and the other crew members from the aircraft 
and established a perimeter. And they placed themselves in the most vulnerable position. They killed an unestimated number of attackers until they depleted all their ammunition. They went then back to the wreckage, recovering some of the crew's weapons and ammunition, continuing to travel the perimeter, protecting the down crew, using every weapon, every bit of ammunition left available. They returned to the wreckage, recovering a rifle with the last five rounds of ammunition and gave it to the pilot, still alive, with the words, good luck. Then armed only with this pistol, after losing his fellow comrade, Master Sergeant Gordon continued to fight until he was fatally wounded. Dedicated to Black Hawk Down, this is the quote of the week. Here's today's military quote of the day, brought to you with support from retired Lieutenant Colonel Dan Bogievich. The military quote of the week uh, is a quote read by Major General Garrison, a task force ranger commander, to assembled members of the task force at the memorial service in Mogadishu. Is a passage from Shakespeare's Henry V. It goes like this. Whoever does not have the stomach for this fight, let him depart. Give him money to speed his departure, since we wish not to die in that man's company. Whoever lives past today and comes home safely will rouse himself every year on this day, show his neighbor his scars, and tell embellished stories of all their great feats of battle. These stories he will teach his son, and from this day until the end of the world, we shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For whoever has shed his blood with me shall be my brother. And those men afraid to go think themselves lesser men as they hear of how we fought and died together. Now tonight, I said earlier, we have several guests tonight, rangers on both my left, right flank and across from me. First one I want to introduce tonight is Sergeant Michael Goodell. He entered the Army in 1990, volunteering to be a U.S. Army Ranger. And he became a member of B Company, 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, serving as a forward observer. Forward observer, as most of you know, is someone who calls in fires in support of the ground force. He was an honor graduate of Ranger School. He deployed to Mogadishu in August of 93, and he was on that raid. He was shot in the leg, but continued to control fires throughout the night. He was awarded a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star for Valor. He completed his service in 1995 and went to Northern Illinois University, received a degree in history, and became a teacher. Also with me is Specialist uh, for retired Steve Anderson. He entered the Army in 1991 to be a U.S. Army Ranger. Graduate also of Ranger School, deployed to Mogadishu with Mike. He returned to duty uh, after he was wounded in an earlier fight on September 7th. It was the third uh, Ranger mission. He was wounded by an RPG. He returned to duty, as I say, and he was also involved in the October 3rd fight. He now he works uh, at American Tree Removal. He has a company here in Illinois. Uh, so tonight uh, at the table, the first one I'd like to talk to, first of all, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Dave, Mike, glad to have you with us. Hua. And uh, the first thing uh, I'd like to, to ask um, is something that was in um, Mark's book. Uh, and it goes like this. Sergeant Goodell, who, was, uh, who once bragged to his mother how eager he was for combat, felt terrified. He was waiting for his turn to sprint across the street. Uh, Mike, how did you feel about combat the night of 3 October? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> about as scared as anybody else that was out there that night. Um, that's about it. You know, I, I tried to uh, tried to get through it the best I can, like everybody else does. Did, uh, but did you think about uh, what combat was like when you were in it compared to how you talked about it before you deployed? Didn't have time to think about it. Uh, with that many bullets, nobody has time to think, so you just do what you're trained to do and think about it afterwards. So uh, training takes over. Absolutely. Roger that. Uh, question uh, for uh, for Steve. Um, talking about uh, the convoy, some people in the book, uh, there's some passages, and you see it in a movie, Black Hawk Down, talking about the convoy taking too long. Uh, you were involved uh, in, a, in a convoy, uh, an extraction, exfiltration convoy, uh, different convoys went at different times. What's your feeling about the difficulties, those in the vehicles trying to get to, to and fro in the city? What, what, what's your take on that? I, I think that some of the Somalis had been trained prior to our, our first 
encounter with them and had come up with a contingency plan to to better fight against us and uh, I think we ran out of equipment if, if we had a few plows in the front of some of the bigger trucks we might have been able to break th through some of the roadblocks regardless of that some of the ambushes that they had mounted at those sites would have uh, been devastating and uh, basically everywhere we drove we ran into an ambush while we turned around and drove the next one yeah well, I'd like to break from both of your ranges just for a second. Uh, we're really privileged, and I'm, I'm extremely happy to have Mark Bowden on with us tonight. Mark, are you there? Well, we just lost Mark momentarily. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to him. I see he's on. Uh, he's he's up on the uh, was up on the on the radio. We'll get him back in a minute here. Uh, but let me go back then to 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 Mike. Um, some people say there was a riff, uh, some ill feelings between uh, the D boys. Uh, Delta Force and, and the Rangers. What, what's your take on that? Truthfully, uh, a lot of the enlisted men didn't have a problem with the, with the men from Delta. Uh, we looked up to them. We thought they were there. They were the most professional soldiers we'd ever known. And we just got along with them and tried to learn as much as we could from them. Yeah, I, uh, do you feel the same way, Steve? Oh, absolutely, sir. Yeah. I, I tell you, when I when I hear about that, I mean, I, I just think, I mean, what I would do if I was there as a commander, uh, that would not be tolerated. And I, I think it was played up maybe a little bit more than it was. I don't know. I but, would agree. It probably yeah. was. But it, there may have been some personality conflicts here and there, but there always are. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you one other thing. Uh, uh, Mike, when you were in a hospital in Germany recovering, uh, you called your girlfriend in Illinois. What did you tell her? I said, uh you know, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to you the other night because I called her the night before and got the answering machine and uh, left a few choice words for her. But uh, after that, I just said, hey, I'm fine. I'll be home sometime soon. I don't know when, but, um, you know, I'll be there and everything will be fine now. Okay. Hey, Mark, are you with us now? I think so, Dave. Hey, thanks a lot. The last time I talked to you, I think we were doing a CNN thing together. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be able to be on your show. Hey, thanks a lot. Really, uh, the uh, the troopers uh, appreciate you, uh, you coming on with us. Um, uh, a lot of people talk about your book. Uh, of course, they, they made the movie uh, from that, and uh, it's just uh, it's a good sounding cry to do things. Uh, think about what happened that day and what you recorded in the book uh, to, to take care of future operations. But one question I had for you, you know, we just had Operation Anaconda in Afghanistan not too long ago. And as you know, uh, two uh, MH-47s went down, uh, initially uh, going after Seal Roberts uh, that, that uh, fell out of the one helicopter that was hit. And then uh, and another group of uh, combat rescue went in, which are made up of uh, combat air controllers and rangers. And, and so we actually had two groups in there. We ended up losing six more, saving uh, Seal Roberts, or going after Seal Roberts to save him. But they, at least they recovered, uh, recovered him. He was killed. What's your feel about Operation Anaconda and what you highlight in the book, Black Hawk Down? Well, to be honest with you, Dave, I don't know a whole lot about Operation Anaconda other than, you know, kind of what you just described and what I read in the newspapers. And, you know, I would have to say that, uh, you know, from what I know about it, it's, it, it's a, you know, very different sort of uh, operation. And, uh, you know, other than you, you see again the, willingness of our uh, soldiers to risk their lives uh, to to try to save you know one another to go after someone who has fallen in harm's way and you know I just think it ought, ought to make all Americans really proud of the people who uh, who serve yeah I think what what uh, mark uh, what Mark's saying here for the for the, the rest of the audience is that it goes back to the, the fifth stanza of the Ranger Creed I should never leave a fallen comrade to, to, to fall in the hands of the enemy. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened to Black Hawk Down, which Mark captured in his book, and that's exactly what happened on Anaconda. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a, uh, an MIA, a POW, a, a wounded soldier, uh, the comrades go after him. You, you take care of your own. It has to happen. And uh, uh, really, I guess uh, what, you, what you put in the book, that's why a lot of, we received a lot more casualties after a successful operation of snatching a deeds of lieutenants was really going after fallen comrades, Mark. It is, and you know, I've had a lot of people ask me, and, and I'm sure that Mike and Steve can talk about this better than I can, but that people ask me if I think that that's a foolish policy, and you know, the idea of sending, um, you know, uh, 
men who are who are relatively you know safe and ready to fight in, into danger, maybe even to retrieve uh, the body of someone who's been killed and you know putting their lives at risk. And you know I think that uh, if you talk to the men who who go into battle, they'll tell you that it means a great deal to them that they know that their buddies will not abandon them, even if they're killed, and that that just gives them uh, a whole lot more. Uh, courage to face what they have to face. Yeah, and I want to, and I want to add to that because that's the second time you just gave me something that I feel strongly about, and that is that the the power of this brotherhood of a fallen comrade. That when you go into battle, that your unit, your your ranger buddy, your your this, they're not going to forget you. They're not going to leave you. They're going to do everything in their power to come after you, and that is a readiness issue. It's more powerful than any weapon, any piece of equipment any size force is that going after a fallen comrade that you know your buddies will do that yeah Steve your thoughts oh I sing here in awe it's that's that's what kept us all alive that's the willingness to fight is is created by that that right there Mike? I, I would just comment that uh, that Ranger Creed that that you've been talking about is something that everybody says you know set five six days a week every morning and if if you say these things enough it becomes a part of you. It becomes something you don't even question. You don't even think about. It's you. It's who you are. And so, when you have that, the statement in there about, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. There's no question. There's no question in your mind about what you have to do when that happens. Well, you know, over 80 wounded, over 19 actually that day, 18 killed. Yeah. Uh, initially, when the bird went down, the first one we lost two. The three, three killed. Yeah. Uh, is it worth it, Steve? Is it worth it? Yes. Every mission that that was given to us by our chain of command is worth it. Mike, it's a high price, but yes, it is worth it Absolutely. because it establishes this feeling for future operations, for why the essence of the unit, why it's there, the purpose, what to persevere for freedom. It's just. Um, Wow, it's, it's, it's hard to convey that you live and breathe and train 24 hours a day, seven days a week with these people. And when something bad happens to them, you want to make sure that the proper, uh, the proper burial is given or uh, the proper respect is given to those individuals that you train so hard with because they were there with you the whole step of the way. You don't want them going on into the next whatever, the next life, uh, the afterlife, uh, being left to uh, on their own. You, it, it's a peace of mind sort of thing. Let me, uh, let me move on just a bit. Um, since well, we're Dave, still... I think if I could add something. Yeah, please, Mark. I, I think you should point out that in the, in the case of what happened in Somalia, in, in, both, in the instance of both helicopters crashing, it, there was no question that you, you were going to go in and, uh, and try and save those people because most of them were still alive. Uh, the, the pilot and the co-pilot were killed when the first Black Hawk crashed on impact. Of course, no one knew that at the time, but there were also uh, four men in the back, three or four men in the back of that helicopter who could be seen, you know, climbing out of the wreckage. So it wasn't a, just a matter of going after and retrieving the bodies of, uh, of men. It was saving men who were still alive and kicking. Well, that's a good point, and so I, that brings up another question. Uh, and some of the rangers talked about this when they had to go back out again. Do you go after one of your comrades that you know is dead, Steve? I don't think that we knew they were dead, and I think that's a key issue. Well, what I if think, you know? Yeah, what if you know? Absolutely, you it, do. Okay. If there's a fraction of doubt in your head that you, that you can help them or get the body back, then it's worth it. Okay. Um, I'm going to move up a little bit out of the tactical level for a minute. We have Ken Robinson here, another guest, another ranger from the 1st Ranger Battalion, older guy like me. And uh, there's a question about uh, that came in on email, uh, and I'd like to ask that question. Um, it, it came from a, a Hank uh, Hablin. He says, since Washington turned down Major Garrison's request for armor support, why didn't we get, or why didn't he get, AC-130s to orbit the target area? Ken? I worked in the Joint Staff when that request came in, in J-3 Special Operations Division. And we had Secretary Aspen, who had come in and taken over as the Secretary of Defense. 
and the secretary violated one of the tenets of the Pentagon that's a pretty old one. There's an old saying that says where you are depends on where you sit. And Secretary Aspen had come from the House Armed Services Committee. When he occupied the seat as the office of the Secretary of Defense, his decision making defaulted. And he was making decisions based on what he felt his friends on Capitol Hill would receive in terms of force protection on the battlefield. And he denied General Garrison's request and the impact of that was he was more concerned about what Capitol Hill would feel about mission creep than he was about what the commander on the ground needed. Okay, great answer. Let me, uh, you heard that, Mike. You are for, uh, 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 for observer. You were calling in fires. Would you like to have had a C uh, AC-130? AC would have been nice, but um, it would have been a real tough uh, mission um, to work around with all the uh, extra helicopters flying around. How about with the dispersal of units in different places? It would have been a uh, much more helpful asset then. Yeah. You know, with, with the t two different crashes, we could have assigned, you know, AC to one particular crash. Besides fire support, Steve, what about guidance and convoys? I, I, well, I, I can't say that it would have changed anything, but I would have liked to have had the contingency. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna break now, uh, Mark. I don't have much time here. We're gonna break uh, for a minute for some for some news. What we like to do is uh, update people on some military news that they may not have heard before. The first one, just so you know, Congress, that's both the House and the Senate today, has 37 veterans among them uh, who have served in World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, and the Gulf War. Um, and as Democrats and Republicans continue to argue about a possible war in Iraq against each other or with each other, I'd like to quote something from Senator Max Cleland of Georgia, a Civil Star winner, earned a Purple Heart in Vietnam, and he says, I quote, the men and women who may be sent in harm's way are, are neither Democrats nor Republicans. They are Americans. We should follow their example. Another bit of news is uh, a few shows ago, we talked about disabled American veterans and a controversial subject known as concurrent receipt. Well, we'd like to come back to you here at the Veterans Radio Center and tell you that uh, receiving both this retirement pay for a specified length of service and disability pay for injuries incurred during service without penalty was just approved this month by both the House and Senate. It will now go to the President for approval or veto. And Dave, I've I got to clarify one thing. You said how many members of the House and the Senate? Combined 37. Aren't there like 500 and... 32 altogether? Well, it just shows that it's, it's, uh, the, the number of veterans in the United States goes down every year. Of course, uh, regrettably, that's the loss of a lot of World War II veterans. We lose almost uh, 1,100 every, uh, I think, every day. day I've heard. 1,100 a day. And so uh, the numbers are, are dwindling of veterans. And then if you put that proportion to, to Congress, not that many people are serving anymore. So uh, there's just not a lot of them there. But, I, you know, when you get a like Max uh, Cleland making a comment like that, he's got a great point. United we stand, divided we fall, you know? Excellent. So, yeah. Excellent. You are listening to the Veterans Radio Hour coming to you live every Sunday at 9 p.m. Central Time. It's either streamed to you by on www.veteransradiohour.com or on one of the many stations across the country. If you don't hear us on a station and would like to, you can write to that station of your choice in your city and ask them to get involved. Through GIM Productions, our webmaster, we found out that we are now being streamed to 36 different countries, and we're doing that with support, support from whoever wants to be involved with us. That's veterans, friends of veterans, and just anybody that we want. Something special, Dave? Yeah, I guess, you know, one other thing, you know, a lot of things are going on around the world. Uh, Iraq is dominating everything. I just want to give you a little bit of news about what else is happening in the other part of the world. And then as last week, a combined United States Army and French operation rescued 250 Americans and 400 French from hostile conditions outside of the Ivory Coast. And, and that's, uh, that NEO was completed by the special forces out of Germany, and my wife's brother happened to be a d d SF detachment commander in that operation. Not many people heard about this op. Congratulations, Holly. You're listening to the Veterans Hour on the Talk, 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 Talk Radio Network. Dallas Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Broadcast Network for over 19 years. 
High quality printing services and warehouse distribution has been our hallmark since 1985, serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. My father was the, the best truck driver I've ever known in my life. Like a family tradition. I'm a truck driver myself. I drove around the states with my cat. To be the truck driver, you not just only see where you go, you see the world in the larger perspective. This is a really good time to be in the trucking industry. The dispatchers get good loads for them. The equipment is very new and then it's very reliable. At GTS Transportation, we make dreams come true by employing truck drivers, dispatchers, mechanics, and many other occupations. Consider joining our rapidly expanding team where we put quality, human dignity, and respect back into the workforce. Contact us by visiting our website at gtscarrier.com or call us at 847-754-4667. That number again. 847-754-4667. The Veterans Hour now returns to duty on the Talk Radio Network. All right, get around. Our Duran 6-4 is down. We're going back in to get him. That's crazy. Is there anyone alive on that? doesn't matter. No one gets left behind. You know that. We're going to talk about our hero uh, today for this show. I want to, I want to uh, highlight a valor story on Ranger Robert Law, United States Army Medal of Honor recipient. He was a member of Company I Rangers, 75th Infantry. Uh, that company worked with the 1st Infantry Division, otherwise known as the Big Red One in Vietnam. And, uh, and Sergeant Law, uh, on 22 February 1969, while on a long-range reconnaissance patrol, he and five of his comrades made contact with an enemy patrol. As the opposing elements exchanged intense fire, he maneuvered to, a, to an exposed position, flanking his comrades and began uh, putting enemy on the, uh, fire on the enemy flanking his, that were flanking his comrades and began placing suppressive fire on the hostile troops. Although his team was short of ammunition and suffering from uh, unidentified irritating gas in the air, specialist law spirited defense and challenging counter-assault rallied his fellow soldiers against a well-equipped hostile force. When an enemy grenade landing in his team's position, Specialist Law, instead of diving for safety, he dived and threw himself on a grenade to save the lives of his comrades. The Veterans Radio Hour salutes the active service person of the week, made possible through support from Lieutenant Colonel Dan Biagoyevich. Tonight, uh, Veterans Radio Center would like to salute Sergeant First Class Chuck Dirks, along with 200 fellow soldiers of the Colorado Army National Guard's 19th Special Forces Group, recently deployed to Afghanistan. Sergeant First Class Dirks also served in Vietnam. His wife, Ann Dirks, serves in the Colorado National Guard as the family coordinator. Sergeant First Class Dirks' comrade, Sergeant Ernesto Garza, 55 years old, was also deployed. He was asked by his grandson, why are you packing all your things, Grandpa? Where are you going? When are you coming back? Sergeant First Class Dirk said that this deployment is tough to deal with and difficult for my wife. On the other hand, I feel truly honored to have the opportunity to do this and be a part of the state's efforts in fulfilling this nation's war on terror. We salute Sergeant First Class Dirks and the members of the 19th Special Forces Group. Hooah. Hooah. Now I'd like to go back to, to Mark Bowden. Mark, I have another question for you. Okay, Dave, before you ask that, I'd like to, to take the opportunity to say hello to my friends Ken and Mike and Please, Steve. please do. <laughs> so, uh, nice, nice to hear you guys. You hey, too, Mark. Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Kenny, are you there? Kenny's not on yet, but Mark, we'll have him on here in a second. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a question here. The decision to leave Mogadishu uh, a short while after October 3rd, you interviewed a lot of soldiers. What was their attitude about leaving? I think that was the single hardest thing, Dave, for them to, to deal with. And I, I've had a lot of people ask me about how the men who fought there that day felt about the experience. and. And, I, and, and if they were bitter about it, and I said, you know, the, the only bitterness that I've heard expressed is about that decision to pull out, because there was a, a strong feeling that uh, they wanted to avenge, certainly, the, the death 
of their comrades, but also a feeling that they were very close to successfully accomplishing their mission. And, and having the plug pulled on it, I think, left uh, not just the, the military, but the whole country with the impression that this had somehow been a fiasco. In fact, you see the word debacle attached to this uh, uh, event more than any other word. And, and I you know, made an effort in the, in the book to point out that, in fact, you know, these men accomplished their mission uh, at, you know, with, with great difficulty and facing you know, tremendous odds. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty lousy that, the, that it's remembered in that way. Yeah, you know, and, and, uh, and we're going to talk to the Rangers here with me here in a second, but one other, let me ask you one other question on that. Uh, you know, a lot of people also think that, you know, when we take casualties, then we cut and run. Well, I think it was a very dangerous thing. And, in fact, I wrote in, in the epilogue to Black Hawk Down uh, that I feel that the decision to leave, um, you know, emboldened our enemies because the, uh, it gave the impression that if you killed a few Americans, that uh, America would pack up and go home. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I think that that kind of, uh, of impression is what one of the things that led to the attacks on September 11th. No, I, th I think you're right. Mark, thank you very much for your time tonight. All the Rangers here appreciate it. It's my pleasure to come on. Always an honor to be on with the uh, veterans of the Battle of Mogadishu. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, okay. All right, we'll see you. Okay, next guest I'd like to bring on is uh, Kenny Thomas, uh, uh, the author of a band, and brothers, band of Brothers song. He's from Columbus, Georgia. He enlisted in the United States Army after graduating with honors from the University of Florida with a degree in journalism. He went to the Ranger Regiment, graduated Ranger School, Fort Mogadishu, later served in the Regimental Reconnaissance Unit. He retired in 1997. He started a band called Cornbread, advisor to the movie We Were Soldiers. He wrote and performs the title track for the upcoming movie Circle of Cross about prisoners of war. Kenny, are you there? Are you there, Kenny? I'm here, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, okay, I appreciate you being with us. Uh, from the book, there's something in there I want to ask you a question about. Sure. The, the book has something that says the bullet that hit Netherly had uh -huh. torn through his bicep. And then it says here... Uh, that I hope they, the, the, then he says, hey, Sergeant, damn, Sergeant, I hope they send me home for this. And you said, does it hurt? And he said, hell yeah, <laughs> but I'm all right. I do believe in God. And you said, that's okay. He believes in you, too. <laughs> then you took over the M60. You trained the M60 to the west looking for the shooter. And what was your assessment of the situation at that time in the fight? What did you feel that time when, when your, one of your troops were hit, you took over the machine gun, it faced uh, the threat, the situation you were on in the street? What did you feel at that time? The first thing was to get the gun up and going, and that was just reacting to training. You know, let's, let's, get the, let's get the heavy weapon back up and find out where the enemy was coming from. And I turned around and asked some of the guys, you know, where's the shooter, where's he at? And we shot up what ammo we had left, and we just... We were out of 60 ammo and started throwing grenades at the thing, and then we finally, the guy was still there, and finally, Sergeant Watson, who was our platoon sergeant, I, I'm kind of asking people around, across the street, hey guys, you got any more grenades? Sergeant Watson's yelling at me, you so wrong! I'm going, the what? <laughs> you so wrong! I, I said, well, you know, police aren't going to do as much good around here, so, and he's like, they're wrong on your back! <laughs> and I'd forgotten, I'd I forgot. I that thing every 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 mission, and, and forgot that I had that law on my back, and pulled it out. And uh, you know, it was a good thing that we had done live fires with the law earlier on because it shoots a little differently than you think it would. Right. And we were able to take out the, we took the machine gun position out finally. But I was uh, right after that. Then you start worrying about your men. You know, you start saying, "Wow, this is this is something for real." When people, when good men start going down takes you into a new level of reality. That's when it's no longer just like training. Well, you know what? I got two other good minutes, uh, two, men, uh, two, two other good men here uh, uh, from the fight. You got uh, Steve Anderson and Mike Goodall. Uh, say hello to them. How you doing, Kenny? Now, wait a minute. You, didn't, you said good men. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you got to be careful what you're saying. I know you're all the way down there in we Columbus, We love you too, Georgia. Kenny. <laughs> you know, what's here. going on, my man? Hey, Kenny, what's up? Hey, Steve. Good to hear from you. Good hey, let me, ask, let me ask you a question, Kenny, and then uh, something we just talked to Mark Bowden about. The decision to leave. What, 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 after the fight, when, when the decision came down to, to leave, after we lost 19 uh, troopers 
over 80 wounded. What was your feelings? Well, of course, everybody was uh, probably ready to go home at the time, but, the, you know, the, the biggest thing is you're angry that you have to go because you came to do a mission, and the mission was to get a deed, and we felt like we weren't being allowed to finish it because that was the time to go in and just level the city. You know, we had the, the, the second ranger company showed up, but now we had all the kinds of reinforcements, and it was time to go get the guy, take the city apart, and so the only thing left standing was, you know, a deed hiding underneath the table, and then we could, we could finally finish what we had started. If, if it, at some point it was important enough to go in there and lose buddies, then by God it was important enough to finish it, and it, was just, it, was a, it just left a bad taste. You know, don't get me wrong, we were all excited. We were happy we were going home in one piece, but for those who, who we didn't get the mission done, that was a disappointment. Yeah. Steve, you're feeling real quick. I concur with Kenny fully. I think that... Uh, Did it break your heart to live? Absolutely. It's in the Ranger Creed. Fight on to the Ranger objective, though I'd be the lone survivor. It's, it's part of the mission to complete the mission assigned to us. Right. Mike? Absolutely. Um, even though I was sent home, I, I still felt a need to be there. And <clears throat> yes, I was, in a way, I was happy to be going home because, you know, it had been a long time since I'd been there. But I, I also knew that I needed to be back there to finish. Yeah, I tell you, once, uh, you know, don't send my men. Don't send me. Don't waste my time unless we're going to accomplish the mission. And if we're going to accomplish the mission, then we'll, we'll, we'll sacrifice what's necessary. Uh, no sacrifice too great, no, no mission too difficult. And so uh, it, it, does, uh, it does tear troops apart, and, and uh, you wonder then what they die for. Why do we lose these people? And so it's a powerful, it's a powerful question. It's, it's tough. And, uh, and so, hey, Kenny, uh, tell us a little bit about, we're going to play your song tonight at the end of the show. Oh, great. Tell us a little bit about uh, your from your experiences as a, as a ranger, real quick, and what you're doing right now, uh, some of the advising you're doing on, on, on some of the shows coming up and the songs you're, you're creating, what's the relationship there? Well, you know, you, you, uh, if, you're an, and, and if you're an artist, you write about what you know or you can talk about what you know, and this is something that, that, that I have, a, I guess, a unique perspective on. There's not too many artists out there that have actually, uh, you know, been to combat with with the Rangers, or, or does they even know anything about, you know, what the military is supposed to be? It, it kind of all, kind of all goes back to the, the very first day when we all walked in the regiment. I got a speech from Sergeant Major Leon Guerrero, and he says, "The world needs Ranger doctors, Ranger lawyers, Rangers entertainers." You know? He's right. <laughs> so there we are. So we're out there trying to, trying to spread the word a little bit and, and make sure that when they do movies like we were, we were soldiers that they. That they do it right, and they pay. Uh, that it's an honor and a tribute to the men who fought those battles. You're absolutely right. Hey, Kenny, thanks a lot for being with us. We truly appreciate it. Good luck in the band. Hope Thank to you, see you again soon. And uh, Rangers lead the way. Rangers lead the way, sir. Cool. All the way. And now let's recognize the McDonald's Employee Veteran of the Week. Okay, tonight we're going to recognize uh, Joel Polisi, a former Navy pilot, is a McDonald's owner-operator who has seven restaurants with his wife and son in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Joel served 13 years in the United States Navy and retired as a lieutenant commander. He served as a Navy pilot, A-6 intruder, at Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia Beach. When Joel left the Navy, he wanted to be part of McDonald's. There are a lot of parallels between the Navy and McDonald's. As a pilot in the Navy, you're also an officer. You schedule operations for officers and crew in the Navy, and at McDonald's, you schedule your, cr schedule your crew. I was a maintenance officer responsible for the proper care and fueling of a fleet of 20 aircraft worth $25 million each. At McDonald's, you do maintenance. Joel said in comparing his time in the Navy to current role as a McDonald's owner-operator. Joel added, procedures, we have procedures for flying airplanes, and at McDonald's, we have O&T. McDonald's is founded on procedures. I'm successful at McDonald's because I was an officer and a pilot in the Navy. It taught me, to, me the importance of policies, procedures, and standards. And now a word from our sponsor, McDonald's. Hi, uh, she'll have a Happy Meal and I'll have the Big Mac. Dad, when will I be old enough for a Big Mac? When you're in college. College. 
Now, when you register specially marked McDonald's gift certificates at youpromise.com, a portion of the value goes into a YouPromise account for a child's education. So, the more specially marked gift certificates you buy, the more you'll save for college. I want to be a doctor. Hello, gift certificates. Sign up for free and get the details at youpromise.com. We love to see you smile. You're listening to the Veterans Hour on the Talk, 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 Talk Radio Network. The Veterans Hour now returns to full readiness on the TRM Talk Radio Network. Okay, I'd like to go to another guest we have with us tonight, Tom Rendell, uh, Colonel of the United States Army, his fellow Ranger, Green Beret. And, and Tom, I want to take it up to a geopolitical level on a question here, and, and, and also, you know, doctrinally, how, how we uh, do things today. How has the actions in Somalia affected politics in the region and deployment considerations of special operating forces? This came from uh, a Hank Hoblin as well. I think that, uh, sir, thank you. I think that things have uh, really pointed out what H.R. McMaster says very well in his book, uh, dereliction of duty. You've got to get the political strategy lined up with the military, the economic, and the informational. And that's really been done very well through the uh, couple of reforms that have been made. Uh, on the operational level, of course, we, we left some questions to be answered in the area. And as one gentleman said, uh, bin Laden has actually cited our weakness or apparent weakness there as one reason why uh, he was able to pull off what he did. We in SOF now try to find a sanctuary to operate from, such as an aircraft carrier or some other place, so we can have our base out of the sight of anybody that we're working against to give us the ability to come in from a, an unknown direction and operate without threat. Uh, we often try to now avoid the situations that develop in cities. Unless there's an absolute reason to go there, we don't go. But you can use locals to act as guides or train them to do the work for you, lead them in, and then also uh, reaction forces. We've uh, spent a lot of time now coordinating uh, with reaction forces, as you remember in Bosnia, your own folks, in fact, with my folks. Uh, all of this kind of serves to maximize our surprise and maximize our combat capabilities. Since we now send the right amount of combat elements into the fight or the proposed fight, we're, we're actually more prepared uh, than we have been in the past. We've made some significant tactical improvements to the vehicles, run flat spares, run flat tires that when you shoot them out, they, uh, they'll still allow you to run at full speed. Okay, great. And let me ask you a question. You talk about cities. Um, you know, some people say that Task Force Ranger repeated the same tactical pattern six times in a row, Mike. Is that true? Um, truthfully, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, we, we did fly the same sort of uh, patterns, same sort of thing. We tried to keep people as off balance as possible, but it wasn't always possible. Should you deploy, employ, I should say, employ helicopters at low altitude over the city in daylight like that? Preferably no, but when there's no other alternative, may as well. You know, Steve, you were involved in uh, QRF a little bit, uh, you can call it QRF, but anyway, reaction, moving in for the extraction force and that, the bigger QRF force with the 10th Mountain. Uh, do you think they should have been included in the, in the, in the planning up front? I know it was a compartmented mission. What's your feel on that? I think that, of course, any any military unit could have been used with us, but the more units you throw into one pie, uh, the more the system breaks down. I think that if we used another company or two from the, the Ranger Regiment, maybe even another contingent of Delta, there would have been less of a, of a command and communications uh, problem. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just pause for a moment. Uh, at the table, really, the baseline of everybody at this table is infantrymen, except for one combat medic. And I want to recite something to you about an infantryman, because really that's the baseline of, of all fighting. Uh, everybody's important, every soldier, every MOS specialty, but this, this is the essence. Subject, infantryman. The average age of the infantryman is 19 years. He is a short-haired, tight-muscled kid who under normal circumstances is considered by society as half man, half boy. Not yet dry behind the ears, but old enough to die for his country. He never really cared much for work, and he would rather wax his own car than wash his father's. But he has never collected unemployment either. He's a recent high school graduate. He was probably an average student, pursued some form of sports activities, drives a 10-year-old jalopy, and has a steady girlfriend and either broke up with him when he left or swears to be waiting when he come back. He comes back a half a world away. He listens to rock and roll or jazz or swing and 155-millimeter howitzers. He is 10 or 15 pounds lighter now than what he was at home because he is working or fighting from before dawn to well after dusk. He has trouble spelling, thus letter writing is a pain for him, 
but he can field strip a rifle in 30 seconds and reassemble it in less. He can recite to you the nomenclature of machine gun or grenade launcher and use either one effectively if he must. He digs foxholes and latrines and can apply first aid like a professional. He can march until he's told to stop or stop until he's told to march. He obeys orders instantly and without hesitation. But he is not without spirit or individual dignity. He is self-sufficient. He has two sets of fatigues. He washes one and wears the other. He keeps his canteens full and his feet dry. He sometimes forgets to brush his teeth, but never to clean his rifle. He can cook his own meals, mend his own clothes, and fix his own hurts. If you're thirsty, he'll share his water with you. If you're hungry, his food. He'll even split his ammunition with you in the midst of battle when you run low. He has learned to use his hands like weapons and his weapons like they were his hands. He can save your life or take it because that is his job. He will often do twice the work of a civilian, draw half the pay, and still find ironic humor in all of it. He has, he has, he has seen, more, seen more suffering and death than he should have in his short lifetime. He has stood atop mountains of dead bodies and helped to create them. He has wept in public and in private for friends who have fallen in com combat and unashamed, just as did his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. He is paying the price for our freedom. Fairless or not, he is not a boy. He is an American fighting man that has kept this country free for 200 years. He has asked nothing in return except our friendship and understanding. Remember him always, for he has earned our respect and admiration with his blood. He is an infantryman. Uh, what do you think, Mike? Who? Cool. Sure. I'll go yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Black Hawk Down. Um, Mogadishu, 3 October, the fight. Uh, Steve, what do you remember the most? I remember uh, not really being oriented to the battle most of the time and not really knowing where I was getting shot at from and, and being able to put it together. And, and uh, for the most part, my sector of fire was uh, blocked by a building uh, pulling security all night. So uh, I just remember seeing the tracers shooting off in the sky and, and smoke and, and fire. Uh, real quick. Mike, uh, do you guys ever get together again? Do you ever see any of these comrades from the battle? All the time. What do you do? We sit around, we tell the exact same stories <laughs> year after year. Uh, drink beer, drink uh, scotch, whatever we can find. Um, we cry, we laugh, and our wives sit and, and look at us like we're idiots. Cool. Well, look, tonight I want to thank Mike Goodall. Thank you very much. Steve Anderson, Tom Rendell, Kenny Robinson. Thanks for being with us, Rangers, for, for the tonight's show. Hello, sir. Thank you. And now a special song from Kenny Thomas, Band of Brothers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We were young and soldiers once. We dedicate our lives in the name of God and country. Do what's just for, go do what's right. You've been listening to the Veterans Radio Hour. Once again, we here at Veterans Radio Hour 2.0 want to wish you the best for the holidays. Ranger Doug out. Thank you for listening to Veterans Radio Hour. Veterans Broadcast Network, bringing you shows like Veterans Radio Hour, Wounded But Not Broken, and Roll Call. Listen each week as General Grange and his guests address issues faced by veterans throughout their lives. My father was the, the best truck driver I've known in my life like a family tradition. I'm a truck driver myself. I drove around the states with my cat. To be the truck driver, you not just only see where you go, you see the world in the larger perspective. This is a really good time to be in the trucking industry. The dispatchers get good loads for them. The equipment is very new and then it's very reliable. At GTS Transportation, we make dreams come true by employing truck drivers, dispatchers, mechanics, and many other occupations. Consider joining our rapidly expanding team where we put quality, human dignity, and respect back into the workforce. Contact us by visiting our website at gtscarrier.com or call us at 847 
847-754-4667. That number again, 847-754-4667. Dallas Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Broadcast Network for over 19 years. High quality printing services and warehouse distribution has been our hallmark since 1985. Serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. 